There's another form of interference that you may have seen more often, and that's called thin film interference. If you've seen the collection of colors on a soap bubble or the oily spots on the road after it rains, that's what thin film interference is. The way to analyze this, first, if we imagine we're looking at a road surface just after it rains, there's usually some oil left behind. That will float on top of the water, and the water is, of course, on top of the road. The incident sunlight, which is white light or all colors, comes in and it's drawn here as a black arrow. One thing to keep in mind, it should be straight up and down for the analysis that we're doing. And the only reason it's offset like this is because that makes it easier to see what's happening. In reality, the only change from doing this the way we're going to do it to doing it in this more general way where you have an angle of incidence that's not zero is the effective thickness of the layer changes. If it's some kind of long angle like this, what the thickness of the layer really means is the path through the layer. So if it was something other than straight up and down, it would be a different path than 2T. When the light goes from the air to the oil, some of it will be reflected, some of it will be refracted or transmitted and bent. This same thing happens when the light goes from the oil to the water. Some of it's reflected, some of it's transmitted and bent. We don't bother following the part that gets transmitted through the water because whatever hits the road, very little of that will be reflected because wet pavement is extremely dark. So the only two rays we really need to worry about are the two that reflect from the air-oil and the oil-water interfaces. To put some numbers to this, we'll say that index of refraction of air is 1, oil is 1.2, water is 1.33. We're going to use the principle of superposition again and see that if we're going to have constructive interference here, then the extra path difference has to be a whole number of wavelengths. We'll get destructive interference otherwise. There are a couple of complications. One is that the when the light hits goes from the air to the oil it's going from a lower to a higher index of refraction and what actually happens there is there is a phase shift of 180 degrees or pi radians or half a wavelength when you go from a lower to a higher index of refraction we have the same thing happen with this red lit red beam when it goes from oil to water because index of refraction of oil is lower than water we'll pick up a 180 degree phase shift here as well. The way you can remember this, if you happen to study waves in Physics 1, and a lot of people don't, if we imagine we have two ropes of different linear mass densities, for example, the thin line here we can imagine is fishing line or dental floss or something, and the thick line can be a heavy rope. If we snap this end and send a wave down the rope, what we'll find going from lighter to heavier is this wave that gets reflected back is inverted. The transmitted wave, of course, goes on in the same sense as the incident wave. On the other hand, if we're snapping the heavy rope that's connected to the dental floss, whatever little reflection there is there will not be inverted. This is just a way to, to keep in mind that the same thing is happening here when we go from low end to high end we get that phase shift. Now in this case it turns out it doesn't really matter and the reason is we got a phase shift for both the black ray and the red ray since they both went from lower to higher. If both of the waves are shifted by the same amount then it doesn't matter. It's just like we discussed before with plugging in the two clocks. The overall difference as long as it's a whole number of wavelengths or zero in this case is fine. So what we'll get is constructive interference if the path difference between the two, which is 2t, equals a whole number of wavelengths. There's one other complication and that is that the wavelength that we might think of as being associated with this light will change when it's in something other than a vacuum. If we look at our connection between speed of light and frequency and wavelength, we see that in a material other than a vacuum, C changes to C divided by N. Because this is an equation, that means we have to have a similar change on the left side. 
It turns out frequency doesn't change at all, but wavelength does change, and it will be reduced by the same factor n. So what we would commonly write, it, this is kind of weird notation, but it's in just about every book, we write lambda with a subscript n, and what we mean by that is lambda divided by n. So now constructive interference means 2t, the, the path difference, equals some whole number of the actual wavelength of light in the material. If we wanted destructive interference, it would be m plus one-half wavelengths. What about if instead of the, the puddle, we were looking at a soap bubble? Things are almost the same as before, only now we go from air to soapy water to air. We can pick a number for soap, the index of refraction of soapy water and say it's 1.25, 1.35, whatever. We know it's greater than air. That's the only important thing. The soap bubble's thickness is T, and it looks like this is going to be exactly the same as the previous case, except now when we go from air to soapy water, that's low end to high end, so we get a 180 degree phase shift. But when we go from soapy water to air, that's high end to low end, and we do not get a phase shift there. That means the two rays are already out of phase by lambda over 2. And if we want constructive interference, we have to put them back in phase, which means now we're using this formula, which is what we said was the formula for destructive interference in the previous case. Now it's constructive. And likewise, our formula for destructive interference is what was constructive in the previous case. What this means is you'll get these equations on a formula sheet, but I can't label them constructive or destructive because which is which depends on the physical situation. There is an interesting use for this, uh, especially if you wear glasses. Anti-reflection coatings are fairly popular, and the reason is we'll always get a reflected and a refracted ray when we have this interface between two different materials, different end values, like glasses and air. And that means people who wear glasses will see reflections of things that are behind them in their glasses, and that's pretty annoying. If you get the anti-reflective coating put on your glasses, you can reduce this problem. The way they do it is they put a layer of this salt, magnesium fluoride, on the glass. This is a very thin layer. This magnesium fluoride has an index of refraction of 1.38. Regular glass, we usually assume, has an index of refraction of 1.52. That means this will act like the oil and water case, since we go air, magnesium fluoride, glass, and that means index of refraction goes up from air to the fluoride and again from the fluoride to glass. This means destructive interference, which is what we want, will be, we'll use the equation 2t equals m plus one half lambda n. Now light is a range of frequencies and wavelengths, so let's pick the center of the spectrum, which is about 550 nanometers. In that magnesium fluoride, 550 nanometer wavelength becomes 399 nanometer wavelength. We solve this equation for T, and we're going to get very close to 100 nanometers. There's actually an infinite number of solutions here. M could be 0, 1, 2, 3, any positive integer. But the simplest one is if M equals 0. We'll see there's another reason to do this as well. We should also make sure that while we're reducing the reflected intensity for green light, we're not increasing it for something else. Now that we've solved for t, we can put that value in the constructive interference equation and see if there are any values of lambda in the visible range. So we plug it in just as we would expect. We know our t now. We plug this in and we get that if the product of m times lambda is 276 nanometers, we'll get something, a color that uh, we've made it worse for. The m equals 1 solution would give us lambda is 276 nanometers, which is deep in the ultraviolet and not visible. If m equals 2, that means the wavelength would get even shorter. It would be 138. So higher values of m won't push this into the visible. This means we don't have any visible wavelengths where we get maximum constructive interference. What if we had decided to solve this equation with a different value of m and used a thicker film? For example, if we put in m equals 100 and we solve for the thickness, now we get this thickness of 20 microns, more or less.
we would still have perfect destructive interference at lambda equals 550 nanometers, but are there any places where we've made it worse? We use this same formula. Now we're using our much greater thickness. And anywhere that we have m lambda equal to about 55 microns, we'll have constructive interference. Of course, this won't happen at m equals 1 because this would be deep in the infrared, but any value of m is possible. If, for example, we plug in m equals 100, that tells us we'll have a constructive interference peak at 553.4 nanometers. We can see we'd have another one at 559, at 548. There will be many, many peaks where we get constructive interference if we use the thicker film. So this is the reason why we go with the minimum thickness. There's no room for constructive interference anywhere. Our last example of interference is what's called the Michelson-Morley interferometer, and there's a picture of this here. Uh, what happens is a laser, nowadays, comes in and hits this thing called a beam splitter, which is essentially a microscope slide. The reflected part goes to that mirror. The transmitted part goes through to this mirror. Uh, when they combine, we combine them at the screen, and what we notice is the light waves will interfere based on total path difference between them. The reason this was important when the wave particle debate about light was going on, one of the things people said was if light is a wave, what has to be waving? There has to be something there. In air, for sound waves, we have to have air waving. For water waves, we have to have water waving. What was doing the waving if light was a wave? And people postulated that that was something called the ether, and a lot of scientists spent time looking for it. Through observations in astronomy, parallax and things like that, uh, people had figured out the Earth can't be at rest with respect to the ether. So if the Earth is moving through it, there has to be some direction we can travel where light will get us will be sped up like a tailwind behind a plane. If we're traveling in the opposite direction, it'll be like a headwind for the plane and the light will slow down. We split the single color beam here into two and let the beams go on perpendicular paths and then recombine them and see if there's a phase difference. When Michelson and Morley built this, it was on a giant stone slab and that floated on a pool of mercury so that they could rotate it and point an arm in every direction. They could just go through them all. And what should have happened is, at some point, they were one arm would be along the direction of Earth's motion through the ether, and one arm would be perpendicular to it, and we'd see changes. They never did see any changes. This would have been detected by movement in the rings produced by this thing that's called fringe shift. And this is when people began to figure out that there is no ether, and we don't really need that for light. It's just oscillations of electric and magnetic fields, and it's self-sustaining. Even though that was the, the original use, the sensitivity of this has been used for a lot of experiments later because it can detect incredibly small changes. You can build one of these for 50 or or $100 that can detect your voice, the sound waves produced by your voice. If you're leaning on one of the big heavy lab tables, you'll see that. If somebody walks by the room, you can pick that up. And it's because this is set up to where length changes on the nanometer scale are easy to observe. If you've paid any attention to the news about gravitational waves, they've just been detected in the past five or, five or ten years by the LIGO Gravitational Observatory. It uses the same principle, and it's so advanced they can measure changes on the scale of a trillionth of a nanometer, which is far smaller than the size of a proton.